Hello, and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 6 from Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition. This chapter is titled Thermal Energy in Thermodynamics. And just like Chapter 5, this represents us moving away from pure mechanical physics. This is dealing with more approximations, with systems that are a little bit messier, systems that are too complex to analyze at the level of individual interactions. Because we could talk about the molecules that are involved in thermal energy and thermodynamic processes like gases and boiling water. We could talk about the individual molecules or atoms in those processes and talk about them bouncing around using Newton's laws, but there are trillions upon trillions of those atoms. So it'll become very impractical to do those types of calculations. So that takes us to this field of study. Okay, and also chapter six combines with chapter seven to be the two chapters on thermodynamics, okay, or thermo if we're just kind of using slang, okay? So they're chapter six and chapter seven go together. This is the first of the two. Let's get to our table of contents and see what we're talking about, okay? So no big surprise, one of the first things we're gonna do is define temperature. We definitely wanna get that definition out of the way. It's something we take for granted, but let's make sure we're all on the same page. Then we'll talk about the temperature scale that's used by scientists, especially physical scientists, and how it relates to something called absolute zero. Then we'll officially define heat, which, spoiler alert, is a form of energy, okay? We'll talk about the quantity of heat, then the laws of thermodynamics themselves, all right? There's kind of three of them, but there's two big ones, and there's what's called the zeroth law. We'll be talking about that in a minute. Then we'll define something called entropy. Some, and honestly, an idea that a lot of people find confusing, but I think we'll be able to break it down pretty easily here. Then we'll talk about a quantity that different materials have, which is called the specific heat capacity. This is a way, it's kind of like density. It's a way of talking about this material specific quantity. So for example, aluminum has a different specific heat capacity than water, and that has really important consequences on how those two different materials behave, all right? Then we'll talk about thermal expansion and how it relates to particular types of situations, and that's basically when things heat up, they get bigger. And then finally, we'll talk about thermal expansion for water, which is kind of a special case, okay? Well, let's get to it. So let's define temperature. What is temperature? Well, it's a number that corresponds to the warmth or coldness of an object. That's how we think about it in everyday life. That's what, what is the basic idea of temperature. It's measured by a thermometer, all right? So you use a digital thermometer of some sort, or you use a thermometer with some fluid in it, okay? It is a per particle property. So what do I mean by that, right? Because that, that, sen that sentence is a little, a little confusing, right? What do I mean by a per particle property? It means that it's directly related to the behavior of an average particle in that substance. So if I have, say, this glass of cold water, the temperature of that cold water is directly proportional to the average behavior of the molecules in that cup of water, okay? The particles, because the molecules would be the particle. The particles is the smallest piece of that substance, all right? Okay. And it has no upper limit, so you can have an infinitely high temperature. There's some debate about an upper limit um, re regarding the Big Bang and the origins of the universe, but for all practical purposes, temperature can keep going higher and higher. But there is a definite limit on the lower end. There's a very well-defined lower limit, okay? All right, and I, I bet you're thinking, oh, that's probably absolute zero, and you'd be right, okay? So when I say that temperature is a per particle property, what I'm saying more officially is temperature is proportional to the average translational kinetic energy per particle in a substance. Okay, so what, what is that? How do, you, how do you break that down? Well, translational motion is side to side, up and down, back and forth motion. Okay, so it's actually moving through space. That's translational motion. So that means that temperature is directly related to the particles bouncing around and actually moving side to side, up and down, and back and forth. Okay, that's what temperature is. It is not directly related to rotational motion nor vibrational motion. All right, because these are other types of motions that can occur. Now, if you just had a single sphere, right, a single particle that would just took up a single point in space, well, that single point can't vibrate or rotate. All it can do is translate. But once you have something like this, which is like a barbell, which is a very t common type of part particle because it's called a diatomic, diatomic molecule, diatomic particle, basically composed of two atoms, like hydrogen tends to do this, it's called H2, it's diatomic hydrogen. Well, that's exactly a, a good example of 
a diatomic particle. And a diatomic particle like hydrogen, H2, would be able to rotate, it would be able to vibrate, all right? But what we care about is the translational motion if we're talking about temperature, all right? Now these other, these other abilities of particles to rotate and vibrate, they matter, they're analyzed on more advanced levels of the physical sciences, sciences, but here we just care about the translational motion, all right? And by the way, that relates to gas because it's how fast the gas particles are bouncing, it relates to liquid because it relates to how fast they're sliding past each other, and then it relates to a solid because it relates to how fast they're jiggling or vibrating relative to each other because they can't actually move freely in a solid, but in the solid they can still shake, right? And there's still translation because they're still moving side to side, individually side to side, rather than compressing and going further apart here. Because this is more like a spring, right? In the case of vibrational motion, all right? So all about translation relates to different phases of matter, gases, liquids, and solids, okay? Now a thermometer is a device that measures temperature. And it measures the temperature by expansion or contraction of a liquid. So you could have mercury or a colored alcohol, and you can see that effect. All right. The reading occurs when the thermometer and the object have reached thermal equilibrium. That's, that's why sometimes it takes a moment to get a good temperature reading. It's not instantaneous because you have to actually rate for that thermometer to be the same temperature as the, as the substance that you have placed the thermometer inside of. Right. And so there is a bit of a time delay. It can be a few seconds. It can be you know, dozens of seconds, but what, whatever the amount of time, it, there is a time delay. It's not instantaneous. And by the way, this idea of thermal equilibrium is really important for the laws of thermodynamics. We'll be coming back to it in just a moment, okay? And there are other types of thermometers that don't use a liquid. There are infrared thermometers that operate based on the temperature um, be, or read the temperature based on the light that is being emitted by that object. Because it turns out that there's a very direct relationship between temperature and color, especially for anything that's not a gas, okay? Here are the temperature scales. In particular, the temperature scale shown in the figure of Fahrenheit and Celsius. Which one do we, do we use here in the United States? Yeah, Fahrenheit, okay? Which one is used in the rest of the world? Celsius. Which one is used by scientists? Well, both Celsius and something called Kelvin. All right, so let's break down the important information here. So this the Celsius scale, named after Anders Celsius, um, who lived from 1701 to 1744. Well, zero degrees Celsius corresponds to the freezing point of water, and 100 degrees Celsius corresponds to the boiling point of water. Okay, so that's the idea. It's a scale that's based entirely on the behavior of water. Water is so important, especially for chemistry and life for that matter. And we have a temperature scale that's based entirely around the behavior of water. Now, this idea of water freezing at zero degrees Celsius and boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, that is completely determined by the pressure surrounding that boiling or freezing water. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius at sea level on Earth. It would freeze at very different temperatures elsewhere on other planets or at different elevations, okay? Same for boiling, all right? But as far as, as long as you're in sea level and as long as you're on Earth, then the temperature scale does have that meaning. There's also the Fahrenheit scale, which was developed around the same time um, by G.D. Fahrenheit. And the Fahrenheit scale, I think of as a very human-centered scale. 32 degrees in the Fahrenheit scale corresponds to freezing water and 212 for boiling water. So you might wonder, where the heck did this GD Fahrenheit come up with these temperatures of 32 and 212? They seem completely arbitrary. Well, this temperature scale was not based on water. This is just, we're just bringing up these numbers in order to make a comparison. In fact, the temperature scale of Fahrenheit was, as I said, based on human experiences. So it's about the most common temperatures that the human body experiences. So zero degrees Fahrenheit is a very cold day, and 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a very warm day. All right, so it's really based on that, about the ambient temperature brought on by weather, okay? But then there is another temperature scale, which came later, which is the Kelvin scale, named after Lord Kelvin. He lived from 1824 to 1907, and this temperature scale is unique because it's what's known as an absolute temperature scale. First, let's relate it to Celsius. So 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water, and 373 Kelvin is the boiling point. Okay, again, kind of odd numbers, but again, just remember that 273 is zero, all right? So 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius, because mostly we're gonna be talking about Celsius and Kelvin, we're almost never gonna talk about Fahrenheit in this class, okay? Because it's just not used by scientists, okay? Now, the big deal about the Kelvin scale is this point right here, the absolute zero is negative 273 Celsius, which means it's equivalent to zero Kelvin, 
And by the way, we don't say degrees Kelvin, we just say Kelvin. It's technically incorrect to say degrees Kelvin, okay? So zero Kelvin is negative 273 degrees Celsius. Very interesting, okay? Now, that is absolute zero. It's a theoretical absolute. We don't know if anything can actually exist at absolute zero, but it's the temperature where all motion stops. It's the true final endpoint of translational motion of particles, because after all, that's what temperature is related to, all right? It has the same size degrees as Celsius, and it was actually designed that way, so it would be easy to go back and forth between Celsius and Kelvin. So a, a change of one Kelvin is the same as the change of one degree Celsius, okay? So if I go up 10 degrees Celsius, I've also gone up 10 Kelvin. Those are equivalent changes in temperature, okay? And Kelvins rather than degrees are used, as I just said, okay? So enough about temperature. Let's move on to more details about thermodynamics, the study of heat flow, the study of heat and temperature and all these ideas, okay? So the kinetic theory of matter, it's a broad topic, and the one way to break it down, one way to summarize it, is to say that matter is made up of tiny particles that are always in motion, all right? As we said, temperature is related to the translational motion. Well, there you go. The kinetic theory of matter talks about that motion, all right? Thermal energy is the total energy kinetic and potential of the sub-microscopic, sub-microscopic because it's so small it's greater than microscopic, okay? Particles that make up matter, all right? So thermal energy is actually talking about that energy due to the motion of all the individual particles. And unless your substance is at absolute zero, which again is only a theoretical temperature that may or may not ever be possible to reach, but unless your substance is at absolute zero, then your substance will always have some thermal energy. And we say it's kinetic and potential because thermal energy can be turned to the other forms of energy. Uh -huh, of course it can, right? Boiling water can spin a turbine. Okay, so let's do a check here. There is twice as much molecular kinetic energy in two liters of boiling water as in one liter of boiling water, which will be the same for both. Okay, the temperature, the thermal energy, the both of those, or neither of these. Which is it? Which will be the same for both? If they both have the same amount of molecular kinetic energy, all right? Temperature, all right? They will not both have the same thermal energy because the two liters has more total particles, and we said that thermal energy is the sum, the sum, of all of the energies of individual particles. So it has to be the temperature is the only thing that is the same. Why is temperature the same? Because temperature is a per particle quantity and they are made of the same thing. So if they both have the same, the same, amount, of, the same amount of energy of per particle, then they'll have the same temperature by definition. Okay, so a bit more about absolute zero. It's the lowest limit of temperature at negative 273 degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin. At this temperature, atoms or molecules have lost all available kinetic energy. Motion has completely stopped. A substance cannot get any colder because there's, no, there's nowhere else left to go. After all, the, the whole idea of that energy had to do with the motion. If the motion's gone, the energy's gone. Right? You, can't, you can't go past that, okay? So to give you some ideas about temperatures, there's a very, very neat figure over here. So zoom in on a bit. About some of the hottest things like a hydrogen bomb, which is 100 million Kelvin, the center of the sun at 20 million Kelvin, the surface of a hot star at 50,000 Kelvin, plasma, which is a ionized gas at 20,000 Kelvin, the surface of our sun at 6,000 Kelvin. Other stars are hotter or cooler, but our sun is 6,000 Kelvin on the surface. Then we get down to things like lamps that are gonna have temperatures of 4,000 Kelvin, melting points of metals like iron at 1,800 Kelvin. Then we get down to things like tin, which melts at a lower temperature, water boiling near, three, uh, near 400 because it's at 373. Kelvin. Then we get down into things that are cold, like dry ice evaporating at less than 200 Kelvin. Oxygen boiling, because oxygen is almost always in a gas, gaseous state. It's hard to get liquid oxygen. In fact, in order to get liquid oxygen, you have to be below 100 Kelvin. If you want to get liquid helium, then you have to be even lower. You have to be below basically 10 Kelvin. You have to be right down in absolute zero. Now, it's dependent on the pressure. We'll talk about that when we talk about the ideal gas law later on. But Ultimately, at, at reasonable pressures or Earth-like pressures, it's very hard to get helium to turn into a liquid, or you could think of it as very easy for helium to boil. It wants to be a gas. And then all the way down there, you got absolute zero, okay? Now, scientists can get really, really close to absolute zero. They can get to the point where they're at like 0 0.00001 Kelvin, right? So you can have fractions of less than one degree Kelvin. 
All right, so very, very, very cold. This can't get to true absolute zero, okay? All right, so absolute zero or zero Kelvin is the lowest limit of temperatures at negative 273 Celsius. Hopefully that, that idea is stuck, stuck in your minds. Atoms and molecules have lost all available kinetic energy once they get there. Substances at this temperature cannot get any colder, okay? So how do we even you know, come up with the idea of absolute zero. So there's a historical context that that you know that applies to you know Lord Kelvin, the person who came who you know coined the term and and came up with the scale. But let's just do a quick thought experiment here. Let's just consider a gas trapped in a canister. Okay. So as a temperature of a gas changes, the volume of the gas changes as well. So at zero degrees Celsius with pressure constant, the volume changes by one two hundred and seventy third for each degree Celsius. Does that make sense? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to lose volume as we cool the gas, okay? So again, let's consider starting right here, right? So temperature, 100 degrees Celsius. Here, the volume would equal one, just, you know, one cubic meter or one cubic centimeter, just one, some standard volume, plus 100, 273, 100 over 273, okay? So 100, 273 thirds, okay? And again, the reason is because each degree would change the volume by one, over 273. So for example, if I was to lower it down to zero, now the volume is exactly at one, right? And that's just because I've set that volume as one. You know, that was, this is how they designed the experiment, okay? But then what if you cool it to negative 100 Celsius, degrees Celsius, okay? Now this would correspond to 173 Kelvin, all right? So still not very close to absolute zero, but very cold nevertheless, okay? Well, now the volume has decreased. See, we've lost one, 100 over 273. We've subtracted that from the original volume. Well, if we continue to cool the substance, then we get all the way down to negative 273 Celsius, which is zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero. And now look what the volume has become. It has become one minus 273 over 273. Well, 273 over 273 is just one. One minus one is zero. So that's another way of showing that absolute zero must be absolute because absolute, you can't have negative volumes, right? So once you cool a gas all the way to absolute zero, it no longer takes up space. It has collapsed down to a single point with zero volume, okay? And that's because gas itself was, complete, its volume was completely driven by the motion of its atoms. It doesn't have volume if there isn't motion, okay? Now, what would really happen is it would phase change. Any gas would actually phase change before it took up zero space. Because after all, it is composed of atoms, and those atoms do take up space. There's there's a known diameter of the of, of any atom. Okay, so it would phase change to a liquid, and eventually phase change to a solid, and it would still take up space. But what's interesting about this is the theoretical process of decreasing the zero volume is di is directly how absolute zero was discovered. Because different gases were cooled, their behavior was tracked. The behavior was extrapolated past the temperature that could be easily recorded by experiments, you know, back when Lord Kelvin was doing this. And then they all, those gases were, re, were all reaching the same zero volume at the same temperature. And thus the idea of absolute zero was born. Okay. All right. So now on to the details of thermal energy. We've talked about how it's the total or the sum of the kinetic energy of every individual particle. So thermal energy depends on how hot something is and how much you have of it, right? And it also depends on what the substance is. But let's let's break that down. Let's consider all the details of thermal energy, okay? So think about thermal energy in a sparkler, right? So we have this, this chemical reaction releasing a bunch of light and heat. The temperature of the sparks are very high, 2,000 degrees Celsius, right? That, that would melt a lot of metals, right? That is an incredibly high temperature. However, there is lots of energy per molecule spark, but the total energy is small. You're not really gonna get hurt by a sparkler because there's relatively few molecules, right? There's very little actual matter here. Even though the, the individual matter is very hot, there's just not that much of it. So thermal energy is low. That means that it has a low ability to transfer energy. It's not gonna burn things. It's not gonna light wood on fire if some of the sparks light on the wood. There's just not enough energy. That energy is dissipated into the surrounding environment because there's so much more surrounding environment, so many more atoms in that surrounding environment than the few atoms in the sparkler, okay? Relatively few. There's still, you know, trillions, but that's compared to trillions of trillions, okay? 
So that's an important idea about, about thermal energy. It depends how much there is. Now, we'll continue to touch on thermal energy, certainly when we talk about the laws of thermodynamics, but this is an important point to realize that we don't know what heat is yet. We have not formally defined heat. Again, we think of heat as being, you know, oh, it's hot outside. Or, you know, if you if you have something that's cold and you put it, you put it in something that's warm, then it warms up because heat is transferred. And indeed, that's the main idea, is heat is transferred from one point to another, okay? So heat is defined as the flow of thermal energy. Very interesting, okay? That's, that's the way we have to think of heat. And it's due to a temperature difference. If there's no temperature difference, then everything's already at equilibrium, which means there's no heat flow, okay? So the natural direction of heat flow is from a higher temperature substance to a lower temperature substance. Heat always flows from hot to cold. All right, that's the direction of heat flow. So we could say that heat flows in this direction. All right, now it's important to consider an analogy. And this is back on a few lectures ago when we were talking about mechanics and the basis of physics. We talked about a quantity known as work. And we talked about how work is related to kinetic energy and, and work is also related to potential energy. Gravity can do work, a pushing force can do work, any force can do work, right? Well, but you can't possess work. Work only represents the flow of energy from one point to another, just like heat, okay? So heat is similar to work. You can never possess it. It only exists in transition, all right? So work changes forms of energy. Heat changes forms of energy, or at least changes the location of thermal energy, all right? So re really, really kind of similar idea there. All right, so heat, one liter of water, in a in the left pot and three liters in the right pot. All right, so more more water in the in the on the on the right. Okay, both pots absorb the same quantity of heat. The temperature increases three times as much in the pot with a smaller amount of water. See, because same amount of heat. Right, the heat flowing in is the same in both cases. Same amount of heat, and since that energy has to go somewhere, that means that there's going to be greater temperature because the thermal energy in the smaller quantity of water is going to be the same as the thermal energy in the greater quantity of water. And more thermal energy in less substance means more average kinetic energy per particle, which means greater temperature. And it's directly proportional, all right? So that's how we see it's three times the temperature. So when the same amount of heat is added to each of the two containers of water, the temperature increase in each will be the same, depend on the amount of water in each, be greater for the container with the most water, or be less for the container with the small amount of water. Okay, so which is it? All right, it depends on the amount of water in each, right? So that's the idea. All right, so how do we quantify heat, right? What is the quantity of heat? Well, heat is energy in transit, just like work, all right? It's measured in energy, in the units of energy, which are joules. But we're going to talk about a new unit of energy, which is the calorie, right? Just like the calories that are listed on food packaging, okay? Well, almost just like that, all right? So joule we've talked about before. The joule is equivalent to the newton meter, all right? Put these in parentheses to show that they're units, which is then equivalent to the kilogram meter squared per second squared, okay? That's the joule, the measure of energy. Calories are equivalent units, but they're just a different fraction, all right? So a calorie is defined as the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So again, very water specific quantity, but water is so important for so many things. So it's great to have these quantities that are related to water. So it turns out that the, the equivalency between joules and, and calories is the following. 4.19 joules is one calorie, okay? So again, they're not exact, you know, they're not exactly equal to each other. In fact, you know, the, the calorie is significantly larger than the joule, but they, they have the same units. There's a numerical different value, okay? So 4.19 joules of heat will change the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius degrees, okay? All right, or by one Celsius degree. All right, now, I did say that this is just like the calorie on food packaging, but not quite. And the reason is because on food packaging, it's the kilocalorie, okay? So on food packaging, the kilocalorie or uppercase calorie is equal to a thousand calories, okay? So let's read our bullet points here. So the energy rating of food or fuel measured by the energy released when they are metabolized, okay? The kilocalorie is a heat unit in labeling food. 
and one kilocalorie or calorie with a capital C is the heat needed to change the temperature of one kilogram instead of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, so when you look at food packaging and it says that it has a hundred calories, okay, it'd be like this, a hundred calories. Well, that's equivalent to a hundred thousand calories. Okay, it's also equivalent to a hundred kcal, which is then equivalent to a hundred thousand calories with a lowercase. Okay, calories. Okay. Now, that's a little confusing, right? That the uppercase, lowercase is the only thing that distinguishes. Why don't we just call them cake house? Again, this is the rest of the world does it, does it that way sort of situation. So if we go to any other country and we look at their food packaging, they will list all of their, their foods in cake house, kilocalories. For some reason, in the US, we call them calories with an uppercase C, not sure why, okay? We probably just like to be confusing, all right? So let's summarize what we know about heat. Heat is energy in transit, just like work. Heat is measured in joules or calories, or big calories, kilocalories. One food calorie equals 1,000 calories. To the Weight Watcher, the peanut contain, contains 10 calories, okay? Or 10,000 of the lowercase calories. To the scientist, the peanut releases 10,000 calories. See? All right, 41,900 joules of energy when burned or digested. Why 41,900 joules? Well, because you just take the 10,000 and multiply it by 4.19, right? So that means that 10 calories of peanuts is 41,900 joules, which actually is a lot of energy. And that's because food energy, fuel energy is huge compared to other types of energy, okay? So the quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of a certain substance of a, spe uh, of a specific amount is one calorie. This is the same amount of energy as 1,000 calories, 4,190 4, joules, both of those or neither of those. What's the answer here? Make sure you know it. It's both because these are equivalent to each other, right? 1,000 calories equals 4,190 joules, okay? All right, so you heat a half cup of tea and this temperature rises by eight degrees Celsius. How much will the temperature rise if you add the same amount of, of heat, same amount of energy to a full cup of tea, right? Remember, we talked about how temperature is directly related to the amount, okay? We're putting in the same amount of energy, so it'd be half as much, okay? Good. Okay, so we've laid the groundwork here. We've defined temperature, we defined absolute zero, and we've talked about heat. Now we're ready to talk about the laws of thermodynamics, okay? So thermodynamics, what is it? I kind of keep talking about it because it's the, it's the umbrella term that really represents everything that's covered here in chapter seven as well as in chapter eight. Okay, but what is it? Well, it's just the movement of heat. It's the study of the movement of heat, okay? Now, the first law of thermodynamics states the following. When heat flows to or from a system, the system gains or loses an amount of heat equal to the amount of heat transfer. More specifically, in equation form, heat added equals the increase in internal energy plus the external work done by the system. That's because energy's gotta go somewhere. It can't be created or destroyed, okay? So also in equation form, we could write this as Q2 equals change in thermal energy plus work by, okay? So Q is the uppercase Q, is the letter that's, that's used to represent heat, okay? So Q2 is heat added. The increase in internal energy, which is thermal energy, is this delta E therm, because delta represents change. So it's the change in internal, in, in, of internal energy, or thermal energy. This would relate to the substance actually getting hotter. And then this right here, the work done by, external work done by, that's just the W with a subscript by. So that represents work done by. Now, it's no surprise that work is coming up. I kept making a big big deal about how heat and work are so similar. So here we're directly numerically relating work and heat, all right? Now, work done by something you're heating up, well, what does that mean in real life situations? Well, we'll see some examples, but I often, I often come back to the analogy of a balloon, right? So if a balloon warms up in the sun, it gets bigger. And when it gets bigger, when it swells up because the air inside is getting hotter, well, that means it's actually doing work on the outside environment. It's doing work on the elastic material that, that composes the balloon because it has to stretch it out. That takes work, okay? 
that will be an example of external work being done by the substance as it heats up, okay? So the second law of thermodynamics, a bit, di bit different from the first, well, it basically is a restatement of something we said before, that heat always flows from hot to cold. In other words, heat never spontaneously flows from a cold substance to a hot substance. That never happens, okay? Heat will always go from hot to cold, not from cold to hot, okay? So in examples, in summer, heat flows from the hot air outside into the cooler interior of a dwelling, all right? In winter, heat flows from the warm inside to the cold exterior. Now, heat can flow from cold to hot only when work is done. So you can physically pump heat from one place to another. You can use an air conditioner to force the house to remain colder than the hot outside surroundings, okay? But that takes work. If you're not doing work, between the two systems, then heat will always spontaneously flow from hot to cold, okay? So the third law, law of thermodynamics says that no system can reach absolute zero. And by the way, I, I mentioned a minute ago that this is, some, this is sometimes known as the zeroth law as well, okay? So when work is done on a system, compressing air in a tire pump, for example, the temperature of the system would do what? So when work is done on a system, Right? You're compressing air. Would the temperature increase, decrease, remain unchanged, or it's no longer evident? Well, it increases. Why? From the first law. Q2 equals change in energy, thermal energy, plus work by the system. Okay? Well, in this case, you're doing work on the system. There's almost no heat flow, right? We can we can assume that the you know that the air inside really isn't. It, there's no. It's insulated because of the rubber, so there's not really. So here, Q is basically zero, which means that the work you do is going to then be equal to an increase in thermal energy, because another way of writing this is we can write it as the change in a thermal energy minus the work done on the system. And that's simply true because the work done on a system is equal to the negative of the work done by the system. Because it's just perspective. Is the external world doing work on you or are you doing ex work on the external world? Well, in this case, the external world being the person who's pumping the tire, they're doing work on the tire. So in that case, there's an increase in the work being done on the tire, which means the temperature has to go up accordingly, again, with the assumption that there's no heat flowing in or out, or at least very little heat, okay? So when a hot cup is filled with cold water, the direction of heat flow is what direction? From the cup to the water, from the water to the cup, random, right? Just we never know, it's just different situations. I just flip a coin, you don't know where it's gonna go, or is it just no heat flow at all? Well, it's from the cup to the water. Why? Because the second law of thermodynamics says so. And so does common sense. Right? Unless you're doing work on a system, heat will always flow from hot to cold. Okay? So now we're going to talk about entropy. And entropy is actually related to the second law. All right? So because you might think about that, that second law of thermodynamics as being a little hand wavy. Because all it says is that, oh, heat can only flow in this direction, you know, spontaneously at least. Well, that's because there's other ways of expressing the second law, more formal, more quantifiable ways of expressing the second law of thermodynamics. And one of those more formal, quantifiable ways of expressing it is using a term called entropy. Well, what the heck is entropy? Well, let's talk about it. So entropy is a measure of disorder, okay? So it's actually a measure of disorder. Some, some systems are more disordered than others. A more disordered system would have a higher entropy value. So whenever energy freely transforms from one form to another, the direction of transformation is towards a state of greater disorder and therefore towards one of greater entropy. The greater the disorder, the higher the entropy. So we see then that that idea of heat spontaneously flowing from hot to cold is the same as saying that entropy always increases. Given the opportunity, putting no work in, just letting systems spontaneously interact with each other, then entropy will always increase, okay? So restating the second law of thermodynamics, we can now say that natural systems tend to disperse from concentrated and organized energy states towards diffuse and disorganized states, okay? So unless there's outside energy keeping things organized, everything will gradually become disorganized. Energy tends to degrade and disperse with time. Think about an organism, right? There's 
when we're alive, we continue to bring energy in and we then use that energy to keep our systems orderly, keep the all of our, our cells operating so that our organs can operate and our system remains ordered, okay? But as soon as we die and we're not taking any energy anymore, well, what happens to the system of the living being? It becomes disorganized. There no longer is that same orderly system, okay? So energy tends to degrade, as I said, the total amount of entropy in any system tends to increase with time, okay? And the only way it doesn't increase with time is if there's enough energy coming into that system to prevent it from increasing. All right, so your garage gets messier each week. In this case, in this case, the entropy of your garage is what? If it's getting messier, it's, I bet you know this, it's increasing, okay? And you would have to put work into your garage to prevent that from happening. Even something like dust, right? Dust is a, is a good example of that. Just that gradual accumulation of dust is a real life marker of entropy, okay? All right, so now on to the final topics of this lecture. And there's a few of them here, so this will, it will take a few minutes to wrap up, but we wanna talk about some a few extra ideas. And a good one of those is specific heat capacity. Sounds a little technical, but it's so important for understanding how materials behave to energy inputs, okay? So what is it? So specific heat capacity is defined as the quantity of heat required to change the temperature of one unit mass of a substance by one degree. Oh, this is kind of like when we were talking about the definition of a calorie, because a calorie is the amount of energy required to do that. Okay, so that means that the, the specific heat capacity of water would have to be, well, one calorie per gram, right, per degree Celsius. And indeed it is, okay? So what, one way to think about the specific heat capacity is it's the thermal inertia that indicates the resistance of a substance to a change in temperature. So some substances, due to just their molecular makeup, if they're solids, due to their, the way those molecules are, are organized in the, the, like the solid structure at the, at the molecular scale, whatever it may be, there are just different reasons that different substances respond to heat either more easily or less easily. Okay, and by the way, sometimes specific heat capacity is just called specific heat. I may find myself calling it that as well. Okay, so substances have their own specific heat capacity. So you can look up tables of common substances and you can find their specific heat capacities. So for example, filling in a hot apple pie has a greater heat specific, a greater specific heat capacity than the crust. Okay, that means that it stays hotter longer, right? It cools off more slowly. So you might burn yourself when you bite in. You probably noticed that, right? Potatoes have a high heat, uh, high specific heat capacity, right? They cool off very slowly. It also takes them a long time to heat up when you're cooking them, all right? So the watery filling has more capacity for storing heat than pie crust. And the fact that we call attention to the watery filling is not a random choice because water has the greatest heat capacity, all right? Of any common substance, there are a few, uh, liquid ammonia, for example, has a slightly higher heat capacity, but of, of all the common substances, certainly compared to any solid, water has a much higher specific heat capacity, the, one of the greatest ones out there in the universe, which is a really big deal. It's a big deal for, for why water is special, at least one of the reasons, okay? So the high specific heat capacity of water, it has the higher, has higher heat capacity for storing energy than almost any other substance. It involves various ways that energy can be absorbed, okay? That's, you know, at the molecular scale, there's a reason for this. The in, the in, there's gonna be an increase in the jiggling motion of the molecules, which raises the temperature. There can be an increase in the amount of internal vibration or rotation within the molecules, because after all, um, water is composed of the big oxygen and two small hydrogens that kind of form a triangle like this, three-dimensional triangle. And so due to that shape and the way that the hydrogen is polarized with the oxygen and then interacts with other polarized molecules, all, ha all have to do with the, the very individual behavior of water, very unique behavior of water, okay? The water molecules can absorb energy without increasing translational kinetic energy. So it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water, okay? Now, specific heat affects climate. So for Europeans, in addition to warm jet streams in the atmosphere, the current in the Atlantic Ocean carries warm water northeast from the Caribbean regions and retains much of its internal energy because it's water, right? Water retains its energy very easily because it has a high specific heat. So it retains that energy long enough to reach the North Atlantic Ocean. 
that energy released is carried by the westerly winds over the European continent. Okay, so you know, yes, the air the airflow is important, but the water flow is even more important. And that flow of water up towards Europe from warm waters makes all the difference of why Europe is so much warmer than say an equivalent latitude in Canada. Okay, so which has the higher specific heat, water or land? What do you think? If you've been paying attention, I bet you know it's water, of course. Right? So a substance with small temperature changes for large heat changes has a high specific heat capacity. Water takes much longer to heat up, right? It takes a lot more energy. And we say longer because we're assuming that the energy is coming in at a steady rate. So that it's often related to time as long as the, the, in, the influx of energy is steady, okay? So now on to thermal expansion because things warm up. Well, as they warm up, they get bigger, right? Well, yeah, sure, surely. So due to the rise in temperature of a substance, the molecules jiggle faster and move further apart. That means that most, and truly most, substances expand when heated and contract when cooled, right? We've probably noticed that. So railroad tracks closely laid on winter days expand and buckle in hot summer. So they make sure to not do that. And if you look at railroad tracks, you see that there's gaps every so often, right? That's so that they can expand on really hot days and not buckle. Okay, same with bridges. If you look at bridges, they're built with gaps so that the bridge can expand on hot days and then cool back down. And those gaps are small enough that they're not a problem for driving, but they need to be there because the alternative is the bridge would break. Okay, so warming metal lids on glass jars under hot water loosens the lid by greater expansion of the lid than the jar. This is actually a really neat trick because glass has a, expands less, so it has a lower thermal expansion coefficient. So it expands less in hot water than the metal. That means that the metal lid becomes loose. All right, so here's an example of a railroad track that was badly done, so that it buckled on a hot day. And here are, is the aforementioned gaps in bridges that allow for the bridge to expand um, and then cool back down, okay? So the extreme heat of a summer day causes the buckling of those railroad tracks there, right? But then, you know, this is something that we, they definitely uh, will engineer to avoid. And the gap in this roadway um, of a bridge is called an expansion joint, good name, right? It allows the bridge to expand and contract. So. When stringing telephone lines between poles in the summer, it is advisable to allow the lines to sag, be taut, be close to the ground, or allow ample space for birds. What's the best answer here? You're installing them in the summer, not the winter. You want them to sag because you know that they're going to contract in the winter because they're, they're, like, they're pre-stretched because they're, they were handled on a hot day. So you want to make sure you install them with a lot of sag because then on a really cold day, especially if it's the climate where it gets into the zero, you know, the zero degrees Celsius during the winter or something, then those, those, they're going to shrink back down. And if they were installed taut in the summer, they'll snap in the winter. Okay. So a net heats a metal ring that has the same inner diameter as the diameter of a metal ball. When the ring is hot, the room temperature ball fits into the hole as before, no longer fits in the hole, fits in the hole with more room to spare, or none of these. So which is it? She's heating up the metal ring, but not the ball. Notice the ball is left outside of the flame. So what's going to happen? It fits in with space, more space, right? Because the ring has gotten bigger, which means the volume inside the ring has gotten bigger accordingly, and now the ball can fit more easily in that gap. Okay, now this is used in engineering. Sometimes things are cooled so that they, they just barely fit, and when they expand back out, they're gonna fit very snugly, okay? Now, this idea of expansion of the metals can be used in what's known as a bimetallic strip, which is what all thermostats used to use. Now they use more sophisticated devices to measure temperature, but this is actually a nice little way of measuring temperature. So when the strip is heated, the brass expands more than the iron. So here's an example of two metals that are used in these bimetallic strips. They're called bimetallic because bi for two, metallic because they're made out of metal, all right? And they're welded together so they can't separate from each other. So then what, as the iron expands, all right, or as the brass expands more than the iron, what happens is it's going to buckle in the direction of the expansion, all right? And we see that over here in this image because the brass is expanding more, which means that it has to buckle in this direction because we have to have the greater circumference on this side. On the other hand, if we were to cool this bimetallic strip, it will buckle in the direction of the iron because the brass is not, is not cooling as much, okay? And, or I should say the brass is cooling more and it's shrinking more. The iron, again, not changing its length as much as the brass would lag behind, which means it will remain the longer circumference, thus causing the curvature to bend towards the iron, okay? So pretty cool, it bends in different directions depending on if things are cooling or warming. So you can see how you could use that in the thermostat to push some sort of sensor 
in the directions of cooling and warming, okay? Relative to the, the baseline room temperature, all right? So here's kind of the setup of that. So a thermostat, when the bimetallic coil expands, the ball of liquid mercury rolls away from the, electric, uh, the electrical contacts and breaks the electrical circuit. And we'll talk about completing circuits and the idea of an electrical circuit in a later chapter. Not, not too late from later, but pretty soon. When the coil contracts, the circuit is complete. All right? So now, expansion of water. Because there's a special case with water. So water expands when it turns to ice. That's not typical. Usually when things phase change from a liquid to a solid, they actually contract, right? And that's because ice has an open structure of crystals resulting from strong bonds at certain angles that increase the volume. This makes ice less dense than water, right? That's why ice floats in water, right? Again, usually solids of the same substance would sink in the, in the, in the liquid phase of that substance. Not so for water, all right? Additionally, water has very interesting behavior in the very tight temperature range of zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius because it actually isn't expanding. It's continuing to contract. So as the temperature of zero degree water rises, contraction occurs due to melting of the ice crystals in the water. The, the contraction of the water continues until four. So water at four degrees Celsius is actually the smallest volume, all right, which means it has the greatest density. So that means that four degree water would actually be denser than ice, and it would be denser than any other temperature water. So when zero degree water freezes to become ice, the largest volume and lowest density, okay? So here's a picture of the volume relative to temperature, and indeed we can see that special point at four degrees Celsius, okay? And this is just showing it here with the other phases, going from ice with its high volume down to liquid water with its lowest positive volume right there, its greatest density, then the density increasing up until it becomes, until it starts to boil. But again, even when the, when the density has increased significantly, um, or rather the density has decreased, excuse me, decreased significantly up to this point because the volume has increased, it still never got to the point where it had the low, low enough density to be, you know, to be less than ice. So ice would still, still float relative to this very warm water. Although I suppose it would melt very quickly, wouldn't it? But then it starts to phase change. It becomes, it becomes an actual gas and the water vapor then finally has something with less density than the ice because now it's just a gas and gases usually have very low density. Okay. But this is actually a foreshadowing of things to come because we'll talk more about phase changes in the next lecture when we continue our discussion of thermodynamics. Okay. So when a sample of zero degree water is heated, it first, if you're paying attention, you know, it first contracts. It doesn't start expanding until it hits four degrees. All right, so when a sample of four degree water is cooled, it, which is it? So now we're going in that direction. We're cooling it down. It contracts, excuse me. It expands. It actually expands out, right? It's not, it's not contracting yet. I said it wrong, right? But it's expanding out, all right? So as water cools in winter, it becomes more dense and sink. So this is a direct consequence of that. That means that the sinking continues until the entire pool is at four degrees Celsius. Then, as the water at the surface is cooled further, it floats to the top and can freeze. But it takes a while. The whole body of water has to become four degrees Celsius first. Once ice is formed, the temperature lower than the four, de four degrees can extend down into the pool. Right? Pretty neat. All right? So the cooling of water in winter becomes more dense and sinks, continues sinking until the entire pond is four degrees Celsius. For the cooling of the water at the surface, the water floats on top and can freeze. And then the ice formation means that temperatures lower than four degrees can extend down into the pond, but only once the top freezes. Okay, all right. So I hope this first of two lectures on thermodynamics has been interesting, and I hope you're looking forward to the next one. Bye for now.